Music from Historic Houses. The BBC presents a series in which you'll hear music associated with and played in the stately homes of Britain. In this programme, we visit Chiswick House. Your guides are Richard Dimbleby and Dennis Stevens. <laughs> A narrow line divides immortality from oblivion. This music of Giovanni Battista Boroncini lies forgotten, though his name lives on as the rival of Handel. Hanoverian London, torn in two between the opposing operatic factions of these two composers, was satirised by the Jacobite John Byram. Some say, compared to Bononcini, that Mynheer handles but a ninny. Others aver that he to handle is scarcely fit to hold a candle. Strange all this difference should be twixt Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Stranger still that both composers should first have been taken up in England by the same patron, and that patron the leader of architectural fashion, Richard Boyle, 3rd Earl of Burlington. Exactly contemporary with the struggle between his two musical protégés was the building of Burlington's notable work, the Palladian Villa at Chiswick, near London. 
Begun in 1725 and finished five years later, its design followed that of Palladio's Villa Capra, built near Vicenza 150 years earlier. As built and recently restored, it was a mere pavilion in the grounds of the older country house at Chiswick. A wit of the day remarked that the new building was too small to inhabit and too large to hang to one's watch. Yet, joint production of Burlington and the professional architect and painter William Kent, Chiswick Villa changed the whole course of English architecture and laid down a standard for the Georgian country houses of the next hundred years. Kent was more than a painter and an architect. He was the creator of English landscape gardening. In the words of Horace Walpole, he first leapt the fence and saw all nature was a garden. The gardens surrounding the new villa were the first expression of a fresh art which was to change the face of England. Though altered in detail, these Chiswick gardens survive as the perfect setting for their central jewel, the villa. Noble cedars flank the entrance. Yew alleys lead to summer houses of classical design. Rolling slopes of turf descend to the canal-like lake and cascade. The outskirts of London became, as nearly as they might, the Roman Campagna, where nature and art combined as a background to gracious living by noblemen of exalted taste, surrounded by men of learning, artists and musicians.
Handel, whose music we have just heard, was much in demand as a harpsichordist and as organizer of musical evenings, for he lived nearby and needed little persuasion when the audience was select and appreciative. He had often arranged large-scale musical entertainments at Burlington House. Now at Chiswick, there was scope for a more intimate kind of music. There, Lord Burlington held his court as a patron of the arts. There he entertained and was entertained by Alexander Pope and John Gay of Beggar's Opera fame. As the actor and dramatist John O'Keefe said, that place thus became the grand rendezvous of the court and all the lovers of sublime music of his day. Handel would have brought with him the finest singers from his operatic company and a group of expert string players to help him with the accompaniment of his cantata in honor of Saint Cecilia. Chiswick House, in the second quarter of the 18th century, was the centre of an aristocratic culture that was both brilliant and learned. The octagonal dome saloon in the middle of the villa, flanked by many other rooms and galleries, was the centre of a way of life which, in the reign of George II, spread to the outer limits of British society. In 1753, Burlington died, and the estate descended through his heiress to the Dukes of Devonshire. Thereafter, the villa at Chiswick became a centre of political rather than artistic activity. In it died two famous statesmen, Charles James Fox and George Canning. But such politicians did not forget the claims of literature and of music, and their friend and hostess, the beautiful Duchess Georgiana, was herself a minor composer of charming and tender songs, like this one, I have a silent sorrow.
Music was prominent also in later years, when two successive dukes entertained visiting Tsars of Russia and other royalties. On June the 8th, 1844, Chiswick House was the scene of one of the most splendid fates ever given in the country. Besides the Tsar Nicholas I and the King of Saxony, the Prince Consort attended and about 700 members of the principal noble families of the kingdom. Later still, the house was leased to noble tenants and for a time to the Prince of Wales afterwards King Edward VII. Now, after a melancholy period of neglect and decay, Chiswick House has been restored to its original condition as a masterpiece of architecture and of decoration. It seems quite appropriate that we should once more fill it with the music of bygone days. Thank you. 
have been listening to a program in the series Music from Historic Houses. The music was given by Gerald English, tenor, Sidney Humphreys, violin, Roy Jessen, harpsichord, and members of the Aeolian String Quartet, led by Sidney Humphreys. Your guides were Richard Dimbleby and Dennis Stevens. The historical research was by John Harvey, and the program was recorded at Chiswick House by the BBC Transcription Service.